All right, um, at our, uh, our third block, our speaker is Randy Colvin, and uh, his discussion is entitled A Natural Selection Simulation, an Inquiry and Experiential Based Learning Lab Activity. Thank you, Randy. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for showing up. Uh, I know everybody's really busy about this time. And um, what I'm going to talk to you about, and I didn't mean to lead you with my title. We're not going to be talking about uh, my lab the whole time. Uh, I'm going to be using this as kind of a vehicle uh, to talk about some of my uh, uh, teaching and uh, um, strategies that I've, I've been using uh, for the last couple of years and um, applying them um, in some of these uh, newer labs that I'm doing uh, for non-majors in biology. Um, as you've probably noticed, uh, motivation has been an issue <laughs> for a number of you. Um, and so uh, what I'm, I'm going to talk about is, is some of the things that we've done with this lab and how it applies to my kind of teaching philosophy and discuss my teaching philosophy a little bit and then see if we can apply some of that uh, to some of um, overall uh, goals that you may have um, in your teaching. So, uh, this is a, a Prezi, so we'll see if it works. All right, um, so I, I use this a picture as kind of a, a, a way to uh, get across a, a major concept that I try to do in each one of my labs, in each one of my lectures, is take something that we're doing in class and apply it to a much larger scale. Uh, now, this is uh, done in New Zealand. They're doing a, a plot of uh, plants, and they're doing species. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, but it's just this amazing landscape uh, that they're, they're doing this in. And so what, what I try to do is, for every concept that I'm trying to teach, is try to get the students to this place. You know, apply what they're learning to a much larger context. Okay? And so... Um, one of the things that I try to do in developing uh, this sort of laboratory is I, I worked um, with uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Melinda Pomeroy Black and uh, Mark Yates. Um, we're all teaching non-majors biology, both lecture and lab. So we have to be in some sort of communication about how we're going to be doing these sorts of uh, labs. And we try to keep it now. Each year is a little bit different uh, of our pacing of how we go through each one of these concepts. But before we do the lab portion, we want to at least talk about the, co the, the content beforehand. Uh, we don't want to have the students coming into the lab not knowing um, what we're going to be doing that day. So they have kind of an inkling, even if they just know the definition of some of the concepts. And so the first thing when we develop some of these labs is we, um, at least we talk about how do we motivate um, some of these uh, students about a particular concept. Um, natural selection. If for us as biologists, that's great. That's, that's red meat for us. You know, we love it. Uh, trying to get that across to the students, yeah, sometimes that's not an easy transition. Um, so what are some of the ways that we motivate our, uh, the students to get engaged? Um, um, I don't know if a lot of you guys know, but I'm uh, currently uh, pursuing my Ph.D. at Auburn University um, in curriculum and teaching. And so I'm taking a number of classes and learning a lot about these, these learning theories and teaching techniques and strategies. And one of the first things that I learned was this, this thing called the 5E e learning cycle. Have, have anybody heard about that before? It's, uh, they, they, it's engage, um, explain, no, engage, explore, explain, extend, and evaluate. And if you can build your curriculum or a lesson based on these five E's, you can accomplish a lot. And so what I try to do is maybe apply some of these learning theories and strategies to some of these labs. And one of the things that I did was I take examples that I know and talk about them so they can understand the importance of this. Uh, these are peppered moths. Um, does anybody know the story about the peppered moths in England? What, what is it about? What's the story about the peppered moths? Industrial Revolution. Yeah, Industrial Revolution, right. Uh, during in the 1830s and 1840s, there was this smoke billowing from all the industrial complexes in England. And this poor moth um, has a number of variants in their um, coloration. This, these are the same species right here. The peppered moths have the uh, same species. We have a, a morph that is uh, melanistic, meaning it, it's uh, white, uh, and then a black morph. And so these are all spread out through the entire population. But during the Industrial Re Revolution, it killed all of these white lichens that were on the trees. So which portion of the population do you think 
thrive during the Industrial Revolution? The black ones, right? They mimicked the soot that was, you know, building on the trees and that sort of thing. While the white ones, they suck out like a sore thumb. And all the little, uh, you know, uh, anything that ate moths was like, picking these guys off. And so they, they have, uh, you know, population estimates of these guys were, these were the peppered moths. Everybody knew a peppered moth, really black moths. Well, after the Industrial Revolution, they cleaned up the air and, was, and did a lot of things. We started seeing more of these white ones showing back up in the population. So this is an example of an, a real-world example of how to bring in um, some sort of um, idea and apply it to them to get them motivated, get them engaged in the conversation. Now, bringing those sorts of things sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but it's one thing that I try to do in each class period to try to get them uh, motivated to learn. Second thing that we do is innovation. Um, here I'm using a Prezi, which I just uh, learned how to do not two years ago or something like that, so I'm still learning the strategies of doing new things, um, uh, new learning strategies, uh, new uh, types of, um, of getting uh, the material to the students. Um, I just read in a Time article that you know the millennial student, student is... Uh, me, me, me. You know, it, you know, they, you have to, you know, force feed them information. They're not going to, they're not going to get it back. So, one of the ways that you can get it is just changing your teaching style, change the way that you um, get the data to the to the students. And so, I, I, we try to do that. And then this gets into to my teaching philosophy of experiential base. Um, I, my background is as a field biologist. Um, ten years of, of doing field biology um, in Alaska, in Oregon, in Colorado. Um, this is how I learned um, many aspects of biology. And so what I try to do each and every time is get my students outside. Um, do the things that, that, uh, that we're talking about in class. Um, now, it's not always easy taking 30 students roughly sophomores and freshmen, and taking them outside. It's a roll of the dice most of the time. Um, so <clears throat> you can't do that all the time. Uh, and even in biology, there are some concepts that you can't just go outside and talk about. It's not going to work really well. And so um, I try to do it as much as I can, but then using these applications, these examples, my background, um, uh, we mentioned earlier, Becky Alexander talking about, you know, a lot of our students have not even been outside the state. Imagine somebody talking about Alaska or Oregon or, you know, dealing with grizzly bears or something like that. It gets them, it gets them in, you know, talking about um, or engaged in, in the conversation. And so I try to get a lot of these uh, uh, concepts in some sort of experience. Another way it, uh, I like to do is inquiry-driven. Does anybody know what inquiry-based uh, learning is all about? What is it? Kind of like student self discover Yeah, it's like self the you, don't, you don't interfere until you have to. Right. You know, uh, I'm great one like this. In math, we call it more method. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, more method. Yeah, it's, it's more like just question-based. Um, I've learned a lot about inquiry. I thought I knew what inquiry was when I, when I, when I was teaching it. It's basically open questions, you know. Let the students, you know, you're like, really? Answer a question with a question. The teacher is just uh, driving the conversation by not giving them answers. Um, and they get frustrated with that. Oh, my goodness, they get frustrated with that. Um, because they want to know the right answer, right? But you're like, well, you know, what about this? What about that? And so there's different levels of inquiry. Um, there's open inquiry, just like I described, where it's just questions upon questions to get at a particular concept, where they, it's student-driven. Another way is you lead them with a question, and then they go out and try to answer it in some way. And you guide them. They collect data, they get the answer, and then bring it back at the end of the class and we talk about it. And so I try to get inquiry into a lot of the lessons that I try to teach. Um, and then in this example of this lab that I'm going to talk about, um, it's really um, kind of a, a big aspect. So uh, Mark and Melinda and myself came up with this lab. It's called a natural selection simulation. And um, like most educators, and uh, we stole some stuff. Um, we, we found uh, this, this lab that was meant for middle school, uh, high school, 
Um, and then we made our own little spin on it. And we talked about natural selection um, in the form of our organisms, which are noodles. These guys. And this is one species. But you can see there's a wide variation in the colors of these species. Um, there's yellows, there's greens, there's blues, um, and there's reds. Um, we, we usually pick about four colors that represent you know, the organisms. And uh, the way this lab is set up is you start out with ten of each color. And uh, we, you put them in a bag, and then uh, we say, all right, uh, we're going to go out, and uh, I'm going to assign some roles for, for everyone. Um, we're going to throw, uh, one group's going to throw these uh, 40 noodles in this grass out in front of the, the, uh, the building. And then one of you is going to be assigned as a predator, and going to try to get as many of these noodles as you can in eight seconds. Or 10 seconds. It depends. Uh, we, I think I changed it up as the lab went along uh, this year because there were some really good predators out there. So we had to, we had to change it up a little bit uh, so we could have better results. And then another group uh, found the pine straw and uh, threw it in the pine straw. And, and then uh, we discussed this whole lab before we even go outside. And we may have them, each group, get them into groups and have them make predictions. What do you expect to see, you know, after a number of generations? Because each one that you don't pick up, that one lives. And that one's going to reproduce. And so you've got to double that number uh, for the next generation. All right? And so what do you expect to do? And so they, they come up with these hypotheses. All right? Which noodle is going to do the best? Right? So let's go back and look at some of these noodles. So what do you think they're going to say? Green. Green is going to Yeah. The green is going to, the population of the green noodle is going to explode in the grass. All right, what else? Maybe the reds or the oranges might do well in um, the pine straw. So they, they make these predictions. All right? And so then we go out and test it. But before we test it, um, we have to assign roles. And I found that this is really neat. Um, when you assign roles to a student, they really respond. And they, I mean, one of the things, you're going outside in the middle of the morning with freshmen and sophomores. Good gosh, this could get hairy really quick. But if you assign them roles, hey, you are a predator, you are a reproducer, you're the recorder in this group, and you give them rules, you know? Uh, the reproducer is the one that dis distributes the, the noodles out uh, in, along the landscape. Well, the predator can't watch, all right? So you've got to have the predator turned around, and then then you have eight seconds to get as many as you can. And the predator, you can't just grab as many as you can and put them in the bag. You've got to do it one at a time. All right? So each one of these uh, rolls, and the recorder is the one that's writing down all the information, helps with the process. If they've got a role, they're going to play their role. And it, and it really, really works well. All right? So the protocol, each of the roles has duties, uh, and then we go out and collect uh, the data. We perform the simulation. Uh, we do it, do it for a number of generations. So each one of the noodles, if it's left out on the grass or left out on the um, pine straw, reproduces once. So we double that information. And so we get all this, uh, this information, and then we come back into the, to the lab and talk about it. All right? So how do we interpret what happens? So each, each group's got some data. And they've got to plot their data. What happens to each one of these colors of the species? And then, in a true inquiry sense, you don't give them the answers. We ask them, you know, why did this happen? Right? And a lot of results um, disprove their hypotheses. They, of, believe it or not, in the grass, we'll go back to the noodles. Oops, going the wrong way. Um, the greens, you, because they're kind of a fluorescent green, they stick out like a sore thumb. And so all the students are going after those green ones in the grass. And, and they end up you know, being the ones that are almost the, the worst out of the group. So, and so once we get these kind of uh, results, we interpret them. What does this mean? You know? How do we get back to that um, slide that I was talking about before where the, the woman's out in this huge expanse of the valley? How do we get what they're doing, they're simulating in this lab to a much broader context? And one of the things that we do 
is link it to real world observations. What does the, you know, why um, did I make the predator pick one at a time? You know, how do, what's a link uh, to that in real world? Can a predator pick up as many as they can in, a, in an eight second period? No. It can only eat one at a time, right? Or why did I just give you eight seconds to, why, did, why didn't I just give you 30 seconds to do it? Because predators have a certain amount of time that they can prey. You know, and so these are some of the questions that we try to do is link this simulation to um, some real world observations. And then I, then I ask them, what could you do um, to change the simulation to better represent natural conditions? You know, what could we do to this, uh, this protocol so it could better represent what a predator could do? Um, one of the ones that always shows up is um, giving the students um, some sort of tool to pick up the noodles, to represent beaks. Um, of a bird or something like that. So if you had a big beak, you could only get the penne noodles, for, for example, or the bow ties. While um, the macaroni are going to be harder to pick with those big, the big beaks. And so you could see that the, that the predator could be the one uh, forcing the natural selection idea. And so, and also you can bring in, you know, that there's different ways of, uh, you know, some, some species are much larger like the Galapagos tortoise. You know, they reproduce once, you know, every couple of years, if that. And they can live to be 250 to 300 years old. While um, we have, you know, these guys. You know, just different ways of uh, bringing in different applications. This was a good one um, when we had the cicada outbreak, you know, years ago or a couple years ago. Um, talking about life history strategy of these guys. They've been living in the ground for 17 years, come out all at once. Why is that such a, you know, uh, important life history strategy? How does this apply to what we're doing in this simulation? So bringing in something that is happening right there, it usually really helps, brings it to that real world um, um, uh, idea. And I think that's, that's all I've got. Um, so questions about it. Yeah, Chuck. Just, uh, uh, yeah, you were talking about um, improving the, the simulation of asking students mm -hmm. about that. It, it occurs to me, uh, listening to uh, what you uh, described, mm -hmm. that Maybe you thought about this, but prey evolved. Yes, prey. Pre the predators evolve as well. And is that something you could factor into this simulation? Yeah, and it's something that we do bring up. I didn't even talk about that. Um, we we focused on color. And the color um, meant um, that the penne noodles, the bow tie noodles, and the macaroni, and the other, they were all different shapes of noodles, but they're all the same color. And so if you use uh, the predator as the one that's going after them, then maybe the shape of the noodles be, would be the, the characteristic that evolves over time, not necessarily the color. And so, yeah, the, the, we could at, bring in prey evolving as well as um, a predator well, evolving. I'm thinking you know, in terms of something more like a real-world situation, I would think that would be the Yes, I agree. I agree, John. So right now, reproduces if you're blue, there's no blue. Like in the noodles game. In the noodles game, yes. Because, I, I mean, like my instant thought on this is this is a wonderful discussion in a differential equations class. So you talk about a population change. Mm -hmm. You have a loss due to a predator. Mm -hmm. And then you you pick back up, you know, as they reproduce. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, this is a really great population project. That's yeah, cool. you can you can make a lot of applications, and we've changed. We've done this now for two years, and we've changed it every every year. Um, just tweak it a little bit, bring in some new ideas every year, um, and it, it's it's just a good, uh, like I said, a vehicle to talk about some of these different aspects of, of, of my teaching philosophy and how I apply it in, in my classroom. Yeah, Chuck. Yeah, I have a comment. I was just going to say from the student perspective, I really agree with the, um, the examples you're talking about. I can always remember from classes when they gave specific examples, like the cheetahs have to spend so much energy, to say, to run like 65 miles an hour that they don't make a kill after like three chances. They're not going to be able to survive. And so 
I think that when you can put very specific examples to it, it always sticks with students rather than just talking about yeah. how evolution yeah. works. Yeah, I can't emphasize that enough. You can use the book <coughs> examples, but goodness gracious, I mean, they're, they're, they've been hit over the head. If you can bring a real-world example from your background, or even you know, provide, and a lot of times I do this too, it's like, all right, I know somebody in here has had experience like this or has an observation like this. Um, you can share it with the class, and we'll talk about it. Um, and, and usually, really, people remember that stuff. And you, if you have word, pro you have a you know, a short answer question on an exam. Those are the examples they provide. You know, on that exam is what we talked about in class. This this shows you know this concept. Um, and so it really, really does uh, help uh, learn some of these, these these ideas. How big of a I'm asking a question about the mechanics of your experiment now. How big of a space do you allot? I, it's pretty, with eight seconds and ten seconds, we can't like, have them like throw them off out because we'd have noodles showing up in, you sure. know, in the lawnmower. For, <laughs> but uh, no, we usually designate, you know, don't, uh, you can spread them out, you know, in a, in a two meter square or something like that, um, but don't go crazy. Uh, because you'll, I mean, you have eight seconds, and then usually the first generation, when they're just trying to figure it out, they take their time, you know, all right. And then they're like, eight seconds up, they got four, and then like the population explodes, and then, but, you know, they've got to count out all these noodles by the end, so they really uh, get better as a predator. And that's another aspect of the simulation is, as, you know, as each generation goes, the predator gets better, has develops a strategy to get, you know, more noodles in the, in the amount of time. And uh, that, that also provides a good... Uh, yeah, the predators do evolve. They don't become like the What might be interesting is to take some of these materials and doctor them with something like a, uh, a fabric primer, or something that fluoresces. It doesn't itself has to have a color go through this once. Then come back, let the predator evolve, give everybody a handheld black one. <laughs> yeah. Now all of a sudden things that were safe yeah. are not anymore. Right. That's no. really cool. Yeah, just say that, you know, all right, this, this, this population has now got a predator that's got a black light. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, that, that's... And then you can see the change, you know, we see, exactly. we see certain, certain species, you know, doing really well, and then all of a sudden, bang, those ones get knocked back. That's really cool. Cool. Well, all thank right. you guys. Thank you.